and those are things do you think that we should look forward to being more part and I say look forward not necessarily with excitement or whatever it might be but would we anticipate them being more available to people Yes. So that is certainly my scientific perspective, that some brain stimulation treatments should be more available to people based on their effectiveness. And this is in particular something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which you get um, for several sessions over the course of a few weeks, and then it often lasts for a bit longer. It's an effective treatment for major depression and in trials and with some success for other conditions as well. And it is really quite safe. Um, and and can be used for more mild to moderate depression. It doesn't kind of require the level of severity of ECT. Um, and there are other forms of brain stimulation that are in development as well, but that's the one that I think there's the kind of strongest clinical evidence for. And there already are a couple clinics in the UK, but it, it is still nascent. So at the beginning, I asked you about whether this book was for everyone, and you said that people who don't necessarily consider themselves to have um, to be severely struggling with mental health are questioning how to improve their mental health or to ha have the best possible mental health. And there are lots of things people are led to believe can help with that. Um, you call this part of the book, Is There a Mentally Healthy Lifestyle? Um, we don't have a huge amount of time left, but I feel like you 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 do sum it up very, very brilliantly. So let's take the three things um, and, and get your reaction to uh, how much they can help. Um, exercise. Very helpful for many people, but evidence suggests that for a small proportion, maybe not helpful to increase your exercise. Okay. Um, and diet. Now, this is a really fascinating part of the book. I think it comes back a lot to what I was saying at the beginning about um, not forgetting about how much pleasure is important to mental health and how we mustn't assume that diets or certain diets can help with mental health and we should be more wary of what restriction uh, can do to people's mental health. Yes, I'm more cautious on dieting for that reason. I think sometimes even diets purportedly to help someone's health can lead to really dysfunctional eating behaviors that can be incredibly detrimental to some people's mental health. So I'm more cautious about diet. I think also stay tuned there may well be certain things that are helpful and I do talk in the book about how if you have particular nutritional deficiencies then that's the exception that makes the rule so then diet can actually be quite helpful but for the most part you know enhancing certain foods cutting out certain foods will it help your mental health the evidence is not strong there I'm just going to quote your quote, which I thought was was a really um, great how you sum it up at the end. You say, unsurprisingly, for anything you might try, it's been shown again and again that when you're doing, for example, restrictive dieting or excessive exercise, if it's making you less happy overall, this is much worse for, you, for your well-being uh, than your unhealthy diet was in the first place. Uh, it is not worth suffering through any of this. If you hate it, the harm would outweigh any potential benefit. But where you seem unequivocal, uh, is sleep. I do think the evidence is quite strong for sleep. It's not a cure-all and it's also not a kind of not that recipe is not the same for everyone. Different people need different amounts of sleep. It might help some people and not others, et cetera, the same message overall. But I, I certainly um, find the evidence that poor sleep worsens mental health and better sleep helps mental health more compelling with one very, very cool exception that nobody seems to know about, which is a very old finding, but very true in a large group of people with depression, not everyone, if you do acute sleep deprivation for a night or so, you can sometimes cause an immediate remission of symptoms. Um, it's not necessarily prolonged, but it can be a really interesting kind of temporary boost of mood and I've heard of people using it for example to to kind of kick off a therapeutic session because that person with depression has temporary relief from their symptoms which is just miraculous if you've been experiencing it for a long time so um just an interesting kind of fact about sleep that can sometimes happen yeah fascinating but generally you um sleep is immensely important and of course many people will know and say to you that it's a vicious circle because if you are feeling anxious if you are feeling depressed you have trouble sleeping and if you have trouble sleeping uh, that leads to increased anxiety and feeling yes i think the direction of causality is actually very confusing with um with sleep so it's um 
the association is very clear, very strong, but which way it's working both ways, I, yeah, it's um, unclear. And presumably that is the problem with so much of this, the direction of causality, because, for example, if you suffer from something that makes you physically uncomfortable, you become increasingly anxious, you become increasingly anxious, you become increasingly and physically uncomfortable. And that is really the problem with so much of this, isn't it? Yes, yes. And I really want to talk about, you know, both directions in my book, mm -hmm. just the fact that it's not as clear cut as you do one thing, your mental health improves, shouldn't be depressing. It's actually really, really important to understand the kind of, you know, dual reinforcement nature of so many of these processes that it can be self-reinforcing in a good way and in a bad way, depending on, you know, what exactly is going on. Yes. And and just to end where, where you end with a fascinating look at the changing nature of mental health um, and actually just talking about that both ways you talk about long covid which i thought was fascinating because you you say that there's this popular conception i think we've just talked about this more broadly that if your disorder is accompanied by physical changes and i'm quoting you because these are your words uh in the body or brain it must be real or not all in the mind and that explains the recategorization that you describe also in the book of dementias as neurological rather than um, psychiatric. And it's often used to argue that these conditions like long COVID, your words, are either physical or mental health problems. Um, but it was just so interesting to me to hear you say a category of illness confined to the mind that doesn't involve a biological change. That doesn't exist. Yes, exactly. So I think it is a false debate to argue that a condition that we don't fully understand is in the mind or not. Mm. I think every piece of evidence suggests that conditions we think of as mental health conditions have underlying physical processes driving them because that's what's driving our mental experience of the world. Um, equally, I think it's also kind of false to classify something as entirely physical and say it doesn't involve the same sort of mental processes. Um, and that's why I, I suggest that although we sometimes move disorders between the category of neurology and psychiatry or between other categories, it's probably not super helpful um, because many of these disorders involve kind of co-occurring processes, processes that are common to disorders we think of as neurological, like Parkinson's disease, but also disorders we think of as psychological, like depression. Yeah, and okay, I must move to audience questions, but your take very quickly on long COVID, which I think is a fascinating one, and you say you could be proved wrong, but... Yeah, I'm very interested in long COVID um, kind of as a as a phenomenon. I think it's probably been labeled perhaps a bit too quickly because it may represent a number of different conditions that can occur after someone experiences COVID. So I think that's probably another level on which sort of the one category or the other debate is a bit wrong because I think it could represent um, several different ongoing all physical though processes. Um, yeah. OK, right. Audience questions. Uh, sorry, there is you, you, you have packed so much um, to talk about into your books. So it's very hard to stop asking you questions. But I have. Um, so uh, Laura says, and I think this is a really interesting question. I was thinking about this um, in terms of uh, the placebo effect, because I was thinking, actually, there are a lot of people who aren't who think they aren't convinced about the efficacy of medicine so would it not work as well in eastern cultures because perhaps in western cultures there's a strong belief that the drugs work but not so much in eastern medicine and, and perhaps perhaps less and less in western society now is that changing the efficacy of medicines i think that hasn't been tested to my knowledge but i would be really interested to see that study so the idea is that your lifelong experiences are driving the placebo effect. So I agree that in a different culture or with a shifting culture, that yeah. could alter the size of the placebo effect. And I think there is evidence of the size changing over time, but I believe at least in the case of anxiety disorders, it's actually increasing over time. I don't know about the cross-cultural uh, effect, but it would be really fascinating to find out. And my hypothesis would be the same as yours, that if you've grown up thinking something else, might be the better route towards feeling better than that would be the thing with the strongest placebo effect. 
Well, it's really interesting, I suppose, in affecting the discussions around medicine and how important perhaps it is, um, you know, not to talk things down or up before we know. Um, I, suppose, uh, I think Charles is talking about, and Charles, please tell me if I'm wrong, but antidepressants, I think that's when you ask this question. And he says, I understand the success rate is 40%. Is that right? Yes, it depends on the study you look at. I wouldn't say 40% is necessarily wrong. I think anything between 40 and 60 is a fair estimate. It depends if you mean that kind of overall efficacy, including placebo or versus placebo. So it's sort of, it's, you know, gets a bit nitty, but I, I wouldn't, if someone said 40, I would say, yeah, fine. Okay. And we, we talked about food. We talked about the microbiome and we, and you said, um, you know, that you don't think yet there's enough evidence of a brain diet, which is becoming more and more thought that there, that there could be. Um, but somebody asked about the poor Western diet, I suppose. So processed foods, high sugar, high carbs. Do you think that there's evidence that that has an impact on brain activity and mental health? I'm aware of some ongoing studies about the effect of certain kind of processed food, ultra processed food ingredients um, on mental health and brain function. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there were very specific aspects of that that did affect mental function. But overall, kind of saying all ultra processed food has this particular effect on the brain, I think that work is not has not been done. So I think it's more likely to be a lot more specific than the way we're thinking about it right now. Okay, fascinating. And Anya says, what do you think about the vagus nerve stimulation? I think vagus nerve stimulation is really interesting because it's been going on for a long time. It's it's approved for a, for depression treatment in the US even. And yet, actually, even over time, a relatively small number of patients have received it. I think you can sometimes get voice changes. So there are other sort of side effects that maybe people avoid it for that reason. But maybe the most interesting thing about it from my perspective is that we don't entirely understand how it works. And so for that reason, I think um, vagus nerve stimulation is a kind of one to watch for the future. I'll give you one cool thing that some of my and um, some of the other labs that I collaborate with in the world are doing, they do auricular vagus nerve stimulation, which is we have a projection of it in our ear. So one way to access it is by stimulating the vagus nerve via the ear. And initially I was like, what, you know, no way is this going to work? But I've seen really convincing evidence that it activates the same kind of brain regions as actually targeting vagus nerve surgically. Um, and I think you know, Isabel asks a question I think we've covered, but it, I guess it's good to ask it sort of directly, more directly as she does, which is, would you say then that positive thinking has effective placebo effects on physical conditions? Yes, I guess I would say it depends what you mean by positive thinking. So I'm a little bit cautious yeah. in my book that I don't think the solution is sort of just think more positively. But that's partially because I think most of us don't really have that degree of control over our thoughts. We can we can try, but in fact, it's quite difficult. So that's sort of what therapy might be for. That's what antidepressants might be for and so on. But I think thinking of it as the kind of end point, if you can do something that could then move your thoughts in that more positive direction, then I think I would say yes. Okay. And lastly, I think, again, we, we did discuss this, but Kevin um, asks about transcranial direct current stimulation. Perhaps this is a different um, than what you just were describing in your experiments. Um, yes. So transcranial direct current stimulation is another way of stimulating the brain. And it's a kind of milder electrical current that's delivered also from the outside of the head in a kind of similar approach. So you often do it for a few days and then you hope it has these kind of longer lasting effects. Now, I think the evidence for TDCS, which is a topic I've run trials in that area before, is more mixed than for the other type of brain stimulation. There is some evidence that it works in some people, but it's not as strong or as general as the evidence for transcranial magnetic stimulation. That could be a physics problem. We might just need to kind of improve our engineering to target areas a bit better. It could also be a similar problem to what I've described before. So some of my work is about selecting the right patients for that treatment, which I think there might be ways of doing. I'm just going to end by asking something you talk about in your last chapter about the changing nature of mental health. With your take on the idea that we are in this mental health crisis 
and particularly when it comes to young, the young and children who are seemingly in a lot of children dropping out of school, not being able to go to school. There's a, there's, there, there is a narrative, and I think the statistics to back it up, that there is a crisis of mental health, particularly amongst children. Do you think that that's true or are there other factors that are dictating that narrative? I think it is and it isn't true. So the numbers of diagnoses of mental health conditions are skyrocketing. That's often what's cited and particularly in young people. But some studies that use the exact same measures, so say symptom measures or measures of distress over time show a much milder increase. So we see this much more dramatic increase in the labels, in the diagnoses. And that could be kind of a good thing. It means people have access to services where they can get these diagnoses. It means people are aware that when they're distressed, it might not just be distressed, it might be, it might not just be distressed, it might be something that's treatable, it might be a condition. It might also be a kind of increased propensity to label distress with um, diagnoses for better or worse. So there, you know, there's a kind of discussion, separate discussion to be had about that. But I do think there are increasing rates of mental health diagnoses. There's a, a milder but still existing increasing rates of kind of distress and mental health symptoms. But the underlying causes of that are quite complex. OK. I'm going to let you go, but also, of course, people can read about the fascinating way in which the internet perhaps spreads um, ideas about mental health too. Uh, there's too much in your book. That is your fault. You'll have to come back for take two. Um, but hugest thanks. I think everyone who um, has signed in will agree um, that there's just so much fascinating information in here and I think also feel safer about the future if people like you are in charge of the experiments and, and where we're going so thank you very very much um indeed for uh for this uh, half hour and I should say an hour and I should say to people uh who have signed in to watch this if you think think it would benefit anyone else um of course they can download the video from tomorrow if they're how to plus but the podcast will be available uh, in a few weeks perhaps a month at most and so and that will be available to anyone to download so uh, if you think there are people who would benefit from it then um, you can let them know uh, thank you very much indeed i've gone over by thank a couple you of minutes. hannah it was an absolute pleasure speaking to you this evening <laughs>